Well, we're in week four of our Summer Stories series, taking a look at the parables of Jesus. And uh, I don't know if you've been getting something out of this, but I know I have been. And so each week, the Lord has just been taking me deeper into his word and showing me more realities of the kingdom, which is really the purpose of parables, right? To demonstrate the kingdom, to understand the reality of the kingdom of God. And this morning, I'm going to do something a little bit dangerous, and I'm going to preach a message on the great feast before lunch. And so try not to get too distracted, but y'all, y'all already had communion, so you're good, right? You're good to at least like 12, 1 o'clock. You guys should be just fine, amen? And uh, plus, hey, God's Word's got something for us to feast on today. And so I'd rather feast on the Word of God than go feast on some McDonald's, amen? And so Luke chapter 14 is where we're going to be. We're just going to jump right in. And we're going to start in verse 1, and then we're going to drop down to verse 12. Really want to set the stage for this parable and what Jesus is teaching here in this passage. And so it'll be on the screen for you if you don't have a Bible with you. And so in verse 1 of Luke chapter 14, it says that one Sabbath day, Jesus went to eat dinner in the home of a leader of the Pharisees. Okay, so this is a really religious dude, right? He's not just a Pharisee. He's a leader of the Pharisees. And the people were watching him closely, watching Jesus closely. Now, I don't know about you, but when, uh, when you're out of sort of your natural environment, sometimes you can feel like everybody's watching you closely. You know what I mean? Like if you're, if you're a, a farmer and you wear, you know, overalls and, and you got dirty boots and you walk into, you know, a, a big city store and a shopping mall, people might look at you kind of funny. If you're a city person and you come to Rhinebeck, people might look at you funny, okay? Not, not saying anybody's had that experience or anything like that, but just, you know, just throwing that out there. So that was verse 1, okay? So that's, that's what's happening here. Now we drop down to verse 12, and Jesus turned to his host and said this. He said, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that'll be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Verse 15, hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied with this story, or in Matthew's account, it records Jesus beginning this way, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by this story. Because remember, again, that's, that's the point, to reveal the kingdom. So here's the story. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. But they all, everybody say all, All. they all began making excuses. Say excuses. excuses. One said, I've just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Those who were uh, in are now out. Get this? So the ones who thought, I deserve a place at the table, that seat is mine and my name is on it. They're out. And all the people who were out in the streets who had been disqualified by these extremely religious people, they they thought they were out. Now Jesus says, no, they're in. Amen? And so we've got to be careful that we don't get in our minds that only certain people belong in the house of God and the family of God. Only those people who look the part, talk the part. Come on. Come on, talk to me now. we got to make sure that there's people who look a little rough around the edges. That's a good church. That's a lively church. That's the kind of church that Jesus is expressing to us here, that that is a reflection of the kingdom. That when you've got people who don't know how to talk, who don't know how to act, and don't know how to play the religious games, because that's not what it's about, y'all. And so the, the out were in, and the in were out. Verse 22, after the servant had done this, he reported, there's still room for more. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. Can I just pause right there and say that there is room for anyone? anyone. Jesus just said it right here. It is not, it is not the select. It is not the ones who, who, are, who are worthy, those who have earned a place. It is not that Jesus says that some were made to burn and they were just never made for heaven. That is not biblical because right here we're seeing Jesus is demonstrating. He's teaching on the kingdom. And he said, go out and find 
anyone and let them know that they are invited. Amen? And so this parable, again, it's a reflection of the kingdom. It's a reflection of who God invites to himself, and he invites anyone and everyone. And verse 24, for none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. In the next few moments, I want to talk to you about the error of excuses, the error of excuses. According to an article by United Press International, the following are actual excuses received by an insurance company from their auto policy holders. Check these out. Here we go. Uh, number one, an invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my car, and vanished. That's super believable, right? Here's another one. The other car collided with mine without warning me of its intention. Um, I'd been driving my car for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. I could see how if you were driving for 40 years, you might fall asleep at the wheel, right? That must have been like a, an electric car or something. I don't know. Um, as I reached an intersection, a hedge sprang up, obscuring my vision. Somebody was probably praying for hedges there, right? Like praying hedges around them. Don't pray hedges around me when I'm driving. I don't want that to happen. And here's probably my personal favorite. I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. <laughs> that one just speaks for itself, right? Enough said. Uh, here's one. The pedestrian had no idea which direction to go, so I ran over him. These are real stories, okay? The telephone pole was approaching fast. I attempted to swerve out of its path when it struck my front end. The guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. Sounds like he wants like a medal or a reward there. Uh, the indirect cause of the, this accident was a little guy in a small car with a big mouth. I've wised up, by the way. I've got water now right here. So you see, there's a difference between a reason and an excuse. Isn't that true? If you're a parent, you understand what I'm saying. There's reasons. If you're a teacher, you understand. There's reasons. Your student comes in and, and says, hey, I, I caught COVID and I couldn't do my homework. You're like, okay, I get it. You know. Then you've got the whole dog ate my homework and all the other slew of excuses like we just read. And those are not reasons. Those are excuses. And one definition of an excuse that my wife used over the years in youth ministry that I absolutely love, and so I'm going to borrow, and it makes it so clear, is this. An excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. Isn't that good? Parents, you can thank her for that one later. It's the skin of a reason. Don't, on the surface, it looks like a reason. And listen, it's not just kids that do this. It's all of us. It's the people in the parable. It looked like a reason on the outside, but inside of it, we're going to break down those reasons. It, there's really some lies there. There's some deceit there. There's some manipulation there that's going on, and it, it doesn't look what it looked like. Uh, it's not what it looks like on the surface, put it that way. And so in the parable, the people who'd been invited to the banquet, they, they gave the master, as I said, some pretty lame excuses why they couldn't come. And Jesus' listeners, they would have understood this. And so something you have to understand as we go through this parable is that there was actually some intentional humor there on Jesus' part. So as these, as these excuses that he's building into the story, because, of course, it's just a story, right? It's not, he's not saying these are real people. He's saying this is a parable. And as he builds in to the story, their excuses, there's some humor involved there because the excuses were just so ridiculous, so outlandish. And so these people who they suddenly decide they can't make it to the banquet, what you have to understand is they'd already RSVP'd to be there. It's not like they were like, oh, sorry, I'm going to have to turn down the invitation. No, they'd already responded and said, I'll be there. Count me in. We will be there. Put my name on my seat. You can count me in. I will be at the banquet. And so they knew about it. They were expected to be there. And so uh, you also have to understand that their absence, especially for these lame reasons, it would have brought shame on the host in the eyes of the community. They threw this big party and like nobody showed up. You know, I mean, this, the host is spending lavishly. You know, they're putting out this really extravagant spread. This is, this is the party of all parties, right? Like everyone would want to be there and everyone would want to be seen there. This is the place to be. This is like the biggest party of the year for the entire community. Everybody would want to be there. And so if it would be empty, if it would be, you know, half attended, or even if there was just 10 seats open, that brings shame on the host. And so here the banquet is now ready, the time has come, the invitations were sent and confirmed, and now they make the choice to reject the invitation? Now after they've confirmed, after the preparations have been made, after the price has been paid, now they decide, count me out, I'm not showing up? 
and they give these sorry excuses. And so let's review those excuses that were given for rejecting the master's invitation here. Uh, the first one in verse 18, I've just bought a field and I need to go inspect it. So you mean to tell me that this guy, he bought a field sight unseen, he's, he's never been there, he just paid the money, ponied up the cash, bought the field, and then this field that he could have gone and inspected any day and any time, suddenly he has to do it right now. Right now when the great feast is happening. Right now when the banquet is occurring that he's already RSVP'd to. That's crazy. It's, it's outlandish. It's ridiculous. And this is the reason that Jesus labels it, rightly labels it, an excuse. He says these are their excuses. He actually used that term there in the passage. Number two, in verse 19, a farmer says he just bought livestock for plowing, and he essentially says, I need to go take them for a test drive right now. Right now, I've got to go take them for a test drive. And the farmers who would have been there to hear Jesus tell this part, they would have been LOLing at how ridiculous this would have sounded to them. And then in verse 20, we see the third excuse given to the master. And honestly, I think this one takes the cake. This guy, in the time since the invitation went out for the banquet, he went out and got himself a whole wife. He got himself a whole wife in the time that it took from the RSVP until the actual day of the event. And so he couldn't come either. And so what Jesus is painting the picture of here is a person of, again, incredible wealth and an elaborate banquet where no expense was spared. And again, this would have been where everybody wanted to be. And so that's the point Jesus is making with the absurdity of the excuses that were given, that they had to be out of their ever-loving minds. You had to be absolutely Bananas to not show up at this party for these ridiculous reasons or excuses. And here's an interesting detail that I discovered as I studied out this text, uh, is that a Jewish audience who was obviously who Jesus was speaking to here, they would have understand, understood rather that these three excuses that were given, uh, they were actually listed as acceptable reasons that a man could be relieved of military duties according to Deuteronomy 25 through 7. And so it's listed there in Deuteronomy chapter 20 that if, if, you, you, know, if you bought land, if, if you were you know, planting a vineyard, or if you were betrothed to be married, then you had a legitimate excuse that you could be relieved of military duty. And, and see, Jesus, as we've talked about throughout this series, he constantly was upping the ante. And so what they thought was an acceptable excuse, just like Peter thought it was acceptable to say, I can forgive them seven times because the requirement is three, so I'm going well above and beyond. These guys, too, they hung their hat on their religious duty. They hung their hat on what they thought legally that they needed to do. And see, Jesus is saying, no, it's not about legalistic obligations. And it's not about legalistic exceptions of, well, the law says, the rules say that I can get off scot-free if, if I meet these conditions. Jesus is saying, no, I want some people who are all in, who aren't looking to just make some lame, sorry little excuses, who didn't really think about or plan out what they were going to do with their life. Because how many know that at the end of our life, if we've just gone through the motions and we've just, we've just been careless and not had the intentionality to be about mission, to be about following Jesus and what he's called us to do, we're going to get to the end of our life, look back and say, man, I missed it. I really missed it. Jesus is saying, I want some people who are deliberate who are intentional, who are living on mission, who understand the price that was paid for them, who understand the banquet that they are being invited to, and who understand that they better not show up alone. If there's empty chairs, hey, I'm going to commission you to go out into the highways and the byways and to bring people, compel people to come and be a part of this banquet. See, Jesus builds into this parable this sense of urgency this idea that we need to always be prepared. And we know that he's returning. And for those who were involved with church in the 90s and early 2000s, you remember the frequent reminders we were given. Constantly being told, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is returning. He's coming on a white horse. We sang songs about the white horse, right? Like, I mean, this was church culture in the 90s and the early 2000s. And then five years went by and Jesus didn't come back. And 10 years went by and Jesus didn't come back. 20 years went by and Jesus didn't come back. And some people probably started to wonder if it was going to happen. Then you had crazy people predicting exactly when he was coming. He's coming on this day and this time. We better get ready. I'm going to sell all my possessions. We're going to go up on the mountaintop. We're just going to wait. 
right? Some people drank some Kool-Aid. People did all kinds of crazy stuff because somebody predicted the day and the time. And guess what? The day and the time came and went, and it wasn't right, right? They missed it. And so it happened again and again. And the Bible says, by the way, that no man knows the day or the hour. If you read your Bible, you know this. It says not even the Son, not even Jesus knows the day or the hour. Only the Father knows the exact time of Christ's second coming. But hear me, it's not that it doesn't matter or that only crazy people talk about the return of Christ. You see, Jesus, while he was still on the earth, was talking about his return before he ever left. So he was teaching about this. So obviously, it's important. He was teaching about it even in this parable. You see, the point isn't that we should get ready for a certain day or time. No, no, no. What we need to do is live ready at all times. We need to live ready at all times because we don't know when he's going to return. But the Bible does say that he will come back like a thief in the night when you least expect it. And so you better be prepared. If you lock your doors at night, if you've got an alarm system, some of y'all, I mean, we're, I know where we live, so some people don't even lock their doors, period. But, you know, most of us do that. And how many of us are taking precautions over our possessions, but we don't take precautions over the condition of our soul, over our eternity, over what God has called us to do? We're, we're covering and guarding things that don't matter, and we're leaving exposed things that should matter. God's called us to protect the things that are everlasting, the things that are eternal, that have worth beyond this life, not to place all of our care and concern over our retirement fund, because I know that stocks have been doing all kinds of roller coastering, and I'm not saying that money don't matter, but I'm saying if it matters to you more than all of this stuff over here, then we're in a little bit of a problem, aren't we? Because he's coming like a thief, and there's a banquet that we're invited to. And if you're not careful, you're going to spend all your time over here, and you're going to say, hey, hold up, Jesus. i got, I got something else going on. I can't, quite, I can't come quite yet, so let me just finish this. And Jesus is saying, if you're not ready to drop it all and respond to my invitation, then you're out. You're out. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. I'm not trying to be harsh with you, but Jesus wants to paint a very clear picture for us, church, There's not to be ambiguity in our understanding of the kingdom. There's not to be ambiguity or gray area of, I don't know if I'm in or if I'm out. Now, other religions, they will tell you, you can't possibly know if you're going to heaven. There is no certainty. But in the gospel, we have certainty. We have an assurance of our salvation. And we need to live like a people who know where we're going. Don't live like a people. Don't live like the world over here. I'm not just talking about sin. I'm talking about priorities. Don't live like a people who have mixed up priorities, because if you really are a a man or a woman of the kingdom, then you have kingdom priorities. You say, when the doors of the church are open, I'm there. When people need to know Christ and I encounter them out and about, whether it's in my, my leisure time or my work time, but they need prayer, I'm praying for them. When I meet somebody who seems hopeless, I'm gonna give them hope, I'm gonna tell them about Jesus. It's about 24-7, 365, living with the right priorities. You see, what we're to understand here is that hell is to drift, but heaven is to steer. Heaven is to steer. We're to be driven by Jesus' words. We're to be driven by the kingdom of God. And if that's not enough to drive you in this life, you ain't steering toward heaven. In all likelihood, you're drifting towards hell. You see, that's the beauty of Christ's coming the beauty of the cross, that God said, I'm sending my invitation. I'm making a way for all to come. He wasn't going to leave this thing to chance because he knew that our default, y'all, our default is to drift. Our default is to drift. Our default is not to steer. Our default is not to be intentional. You're not going to wake up tomorrow morning and, and just immediately, instinctually do all the right things for Jesus. No, it's going to be a daily taking up your cross. It's going to be a daily crucifying your flesh, a daily getting into the word of God, a daily communing with him in prayer. And if you're not doing any of those things, you're going to drift. You're going to drift. And before long, you're going to find yourself in a place that you never intended to be, paying a price that you cannot afford to pay. And I'm telling you what, it's going to keep you there longer than you ever planned on staying. God's calling us to a daily devotion with him because it's the only way that we can steer towards the kingdom. Otherwise, we're bound to drift. So we should be shaping our life around the reality of Christ's return and living as a people who are in a constant state of readiness, mindful of eternity. Listen, I understand there is some profound, wonderful teaching 
on the end times, on eschatology, and it has its place, and it is important. But can I tell you that we can even get mixed up there because we can get so caught up in the details about knowing it, understanding it, comprehending it, predicting it, planning it, that we forget to be living in light of eternity, that it should impact the way we live our day-to-day life, the way that we interact with people, understanding that there is a soon-coming king, that there is a judge, that we will give an account for how we live. And it won't matter how much we knew. It won't matter how much intellectual knowledge we stored up for ourselves if, now that stuff is helpful, it is important, but it won't matter if we didn't apply it to our lives if we didn't put it into practice, if we didn't have the fear of God ruling our hearts. Because can I tell you, if you don't have the fear of God ruling your heart, believing that he really is coming again, then you will default to the fear of man. You will default to fear something because your heart was made to fear God. And when you don't fill that void in your heart of fearing God, you're going to fill it with something else. And there's a lot of people who are led by fear of all kinds of circumstances, all kinds of things, the economy, the virus, the whatever, the politician, whatever it is, they're led by a fear because they are not filling that void in their heart with the fear of God, understanding that he is coming back, living in light of eternity. It shapes the way that we live, and that's how we maintain a sense of readiness for Jesus' return. So if we're honest with ourselves as we look at this parable in this story that Jesus is telling, most of us, we don't have to look too hard to realize we do the same thing. We make those excuses, lame excuses a lot of the time. Yet one of the crystal clear messages of the parable is that we must live with a sense of urgency because there is no such thing as cruise control Christianity. There isn't. And listen, there is a world out there that is rejecting Christianity like never before in America. There is a world out there that is rejecting pastors like never before. Hey, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. Oh, well, let me tell you what I think about that, right? I'm telling you that there is a hostility in the world and in our nation like we have never seen in our lifetime towards the gospel and towards people who say, I am a Christian. There are people who have walked away from the church who have said, I'm going to deconstruct my, my faith. I'm going to deconstruct what I was taught uh, in, in church and in religion and because I'm, not, I'm going to walk away from the faith. I'm going to walk away from the truth. And here's what I'm telling you is that as the church of Jesus Christ, as the people of God, if we don't become a people with right priorities, if we don't become a people who live with a sense of urgency, if we are these who make these lame excuses, how can we expect a a watching, skeptical, perhaps wounded world to ever buy back in to what we're selling? We've got to live different. We've got to look and say, how did they get there? Now, some of it you're not going to be able to prevent. Hear me. There's always going to be haters. There's always going to be doubters. There's always going to be people who reject Christ. But we don't take our cues from them. We don't take our cues from them. We take our cues from Jesus, who in this parable said, invite them all. Invite them all. He'll take care of cleaning them. You just be sure you're out there casting your net as wide as you can and try to catch them. Okay? And so we need to be a people who who live with a consistent witness That what we preach is what we practice. That there is a real consistency about those things. And so we've got to understand the hour and the season that we're living in, though, church. We've got to look at the times and understand what this is. You see, you don't have to watch the news for more than five minutes to see it. More than five minutes a week. You'd get the idea that any time right becomes wrong and wrong becomes right, we should be able to very easily interpret the signs of the times that we're living in. And that's the day that we're in, y'all. Make no mistake. Good is being called evil, and evil is being called good. When six- and seven-year-old children are being told that they can choose their gender and doctors are willing to perform radical, life-altering surgeries, we've got to see this as the demonic agenda that it is, friends. It is straight from the pit of hell. The enemy wants to rob this generation of its destiny. And if, it can, if the enemy can, can alter their identity, he can alter their destiny. And that's his end game. That's his plan. Hear me now. This isn't the season to stand back and label a generation as heathen. And that's, that's what we have to resist, church, because the religious thing that people want to do, the religious hypocrisy in us wants to stand back, point our finger, and say, look how ugly that is. Look how heathen they are. But this generation, I believe, is positioned to do great things for God. And that's why the enemy is coming after them so hard. 
That's why he's opposing them the way that he is and trying to strip them of their identity and strip them even from the breath in their lungs before they can even take one. This is the kind of attack, the all-out assault of hell that is coming against a generation, and it's going to take men and women of God to stand up in their rightful place as watchmen on the wall and say, not on my shift, that ain't happening on my watch, and I'm going to speak life over that generation. I'm going to speak purpose over them. I'm going to speak the identity of God over them. I'm not going to call them heathen. I'm not going to join with the enemy and start accusing them and labeling them the way the world does. This isn't the time to speak death over our kids and over our grandkids. In this hour, we need to realize the urgency of the moment. Just as Satan targeted children when Moses was being raised up as a deliverer, didn't he? He was targeting children then. When Jesus arrived on the scene and the wise men saw the star in the east, who did he go after? The children. Why? Because he knew that deliverance was on the horizon. Deliverance was on its way. I believe this generation has deliverance as a part of their destiny, that they were fashioned for this season that they're in, for this moment in time, to bring about a deliverance through the power of God because they're going to step into their identity. They're going to step into their purpose. And we're going to stand back and go, oh my goodness, that's the greatest revival the world has ever known. And it came from a people that the enemy so adamantly opposed, so fiercely tried to sabotage and undermine, who he tried to come against their identity, he tried to take the breath from their very lungs, but in the midst of adversity, God is going to do his best work. He always has, and he always will. So that tells me we've got a generation that's on the verge of deliverance because the enemy has always pulled out all the stops against the kids when he knows his back is up against the wall. And that's when he acts with urgency, guys. When we see the enemy acting with urgency, and he is, make no mistake, he is acting with urgency in this hour. When he acts with urgency, that's because he feels threatened. That's because he feels his back is up against the wall. But I believe we're seeing the first fruits of deliverance in this hour as Roe v. Wade has been repealed with a liberal president and Congress. Come on, liberal people in power, and yet, don't tell me God's not on the move. Don't tell me God isn't bigger than government and politicians and lobbyists and money. My God is bigger. My God is able. And he's issuing his invitation today to his great banquet, to his marriage supper, and all the lame excuses that we muster, they're not going to cut it in the end. They're not. They're not going to cut it in the end. And so why? Well, 1 John 2 tells us exactly why this is true. Let's look at that in verse 15. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. Verse 17, and here's the problem. This world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. When you have the love of the Father in you, your love is for his kingdom. Not for your kingdom, for his kingdom. And I believe if we lean into that word, we're going to see where the disparity exists in our lives, where we've made excuses as to why my life isn't truly prioritizing his kingdom, why I've been spending time building my kingdom with my oxen, with my land that I'm buying, with my betrothal plans, whatever it is, right? But when you have the love of the Father in you, your love is for the kingdom, not the things of this world, not the temporal desires and pleasures of this life. So here's the thing I see in the text, that you can place your bet on what's eternal, or you can bet on what God's already told you isn't going to last. And I don't know how dumb you'd have to be to put your bet there. You know what I mean? God, the God of the universe, who stands outside of time, who knows the end from the beginning, he tells us what's going to pass away. And he tells us what's not going to pass away. And so if we're going to bet on the things that aren't going to last, you got to be some kind of stupid. You know what I mean? Like, that, that takes a special kind of dumb to, to do something like that. And I've, I mean, really, there's going to come a day where everyone's going to see the truth, and it's at that moment that it's going to hit them. Man, what an idiot I was, right? Like, so I would rather be told right now if I'm being dumb. I'm not being mean. I'd rather be told now if I'm making a stupid choice than wait until it's too late. And so, uh, you know, he's given us all the insider info. Insider trading may be barred. It may be illegal at the stock market. But in the kingdom, God's willing to give us insider info to set us up for victory so that we are bound to win. He tells us what we need to know. This thing, the gig is rigged, y'all. 
like the outcome is already decided and he has clued us in to how we can be a part of the, the victorious side of things. And if we choose not to be there, the reality is we're just rejecting his invitation like these people did. We're rejecting it. It's not, I don't care what you had to do instead. I don't care what your other priorities were, what your reasons are, your excuses are. The reality is at the end of the day, if you're not at the table, then you rejected it. I don't know how it is in your house, but in my house, when, when dinner is made, when dinner is ready, and when all five million of our children and myself are called to the table to eat, you better show up. You know what I mean? If you don't show up, you're out of luck. You better show up because the, the meal has been prepared. It is laid out. And if you reject it, that's on you. That's on you. So bottom line is it's only a matter of time before you discover that you've made a bad deal, though. You see, if you go and trade your seat at the king's banqueting table for what 1 John 2 calls the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, you're going to realize pretty quickly what a bad deal you've made. You see, we call them reasons and excuses, but in actuality, they're trades. You're constantly trading in your life. You're choosing between one of two things, and you're swapping one for the other, whether you realize it or not. It's, it's choosing one thing over another. It's exchanging one for something else. So in response to the challenge of this parable, we need to ask ourselves this question. What is my excuse for not responding to the call of God on my life? What is my excuse? The man who acquired the land, the one who bought the oxen, the guy who betrothed the wife, they thought they had a good reason to be too busy to be about the things of the kingdom. But in reality, anyone with eyes could see, they could recognize the obvious error of their lame excuses. And the bottom line is, they weren't excused. We think our excuse excuses us. But God says, no, I don't care what your excuse is, you're not excused. You're not excused. Now, it's easy to look at the people represented in this parable and think how foolish they were, but the truth is, most of us operate the same way because the reality is they didn't tell the master no. They didn't. What they told the master was, not right now. Not right now. Not right now. Not right now. In other words, it's not the blatant rebellion we're in danger of. It's the small and subtle compromises. It's a lack of urgency for God's kingdom that we don't respond with an immediate yes. It's a, hey, I'm going to think about that one, God. I'm going to pray on that. Uh, I'll get back to you, right? That's, that's what they're guilty of here. You know, maybe you know God's calling you to step into the gift of generosity and be a multiplier for his kingdom with tithes and offerings, but you're trying to hit some financial goals right now, and so you're like, hey, I'm going to accept the invitation someday, God, but, but not today, not right now. Maybe there's a relationship that you're in that's not God-honoring, and it's pulling you deeper and deeper into sin. You know God wants you to sever those ties, but you delay because it's, it's really pleasurable right now, and hey, I can repent another day. There'll be time for repentance tomorrow, but I'm going to enjoy this today. And tomorrow might not come. Or maybe you, maybe you sense God's leading you to have some courageously vulnerable conversations to actually let people into your world, to take down the walls and to, to be vulnerable with somebody else, to really do life together, to really be a part of the, the body of Christ in community with one another, to talk with somebody about what's really going on in your life, but then fear and discomfort, they stand in your way and you say, not now. It's just too uncomfortable. Whatever our excuse is, it only robs us. You're not robbing the king. He's, he doesn't, frankly, he doesn't need our worship. He wants it. He wants relationship with us. He desires us. But at the end of the day, he doesn't need it. We need him. We need our purpose. We need the things of God that he's putting before us on this banqueting table. We need to show up. We need to take our seat, and we need to eat of the good things of God. Because here's the thing, if we just tell him not now, over and over and over and over again, how is that really any different than just telling him no? Because if it's me, and you're all thankful it's not, but if it's me, and you're just like, not now, God, not now, God, not now, God, I'm just going to break it down to say, why don't you just tell me no? I'd rather you just say no or yes instead of all this not now stuff. You know what I mean? Like, you want to know where you stand with somebody. Because here's what I know. Everyone acts with urgency for what matters most to them. It's proof of where your priorities are at. And so how about our work commitments? I mean, we look at the, you know, the urgent land acquisition, the oxen purchase, the wedding. But what about our hobbies? What about our relationships? What about our pleasure spending and leisure activities? What about our sports obsession? We've all got our excuses. 
We've all got things that we'll act with urgency for, and Jesus is calling us to make him the priority over it all. It doesn't mean we can't have anything else going on in our life, but it just comes down to priorities. And listen to me, guys. Priorities and intentions are not the same thing. God's not going to evaluate what were truly your priorities based on what was just in your heart. He's going to evaluate what was truly in your heart by how you lived your life. All you got to do is look at your calendar, look at your checkbook. You're going to see where your priorities are in the end. And that's what's going to speak so much louder than our words, so much louder than all of our excuses is how we truly live our life. Did we show up at the table? Did we respond to the invitation? Jesus is calling us to make him the priority, to act with urgency for the kingdom of God, to live in a state of readiness because we love him, not because we just want to, we want to spare ourselves punishment. Can I tell you there's a big difference between living in fear, in reaction to darkness, running from the enemy, fearful of being punished for your sins versus living your life out of a love for Jesus, living your life out of a devotion to him that comes from the heart, that has nothing to do with outward action, but has everything to do with the overflow, what spills out of you. Then it just com- it comes with great joy. It's not like, oh, man, I've got to do the religious stuff. Pastor said all this stuff about excuses. and rah, rah, rah. No, it's I want to serve Jesus with my whole heart, with my whole life, withholding nothing from him. I want to live with urgency for the kingdom of God. Amen. So what have you been delaying that you know God's calling you to do? Where have you been putting off things that God is calling urgent? Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this once, that when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. There's a lot of internet preachers out there today that will tell you how to live, but can I tell you that what we really need to do is we need to get back to what the scriptures say about how I need to die to myself. I need to die to myself because if we just teach you how to live and we never teach you how to die, all you do is you just add Jesus on top of all your other stuff, but when you die, you strip it all down, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, it's all got to go, and I need Jesus and Jesus alone. I'm going to make the trade. All of this for all of that. It's a trade that is worth it. I'm not just going to put Jesus on top of my lust of the flesh, my lust of the eye, my pride of life, and all the other things and my excuses, because that's not going to get it done. And can I just say this? When people want to deconstruct Christianity, walk away from the faith, I would bet you more times than not, that's what they've been doing. They've been putting Jesus on top of all this other stuff. They did not strip it all down and sell it all and say, I'm going to follow Jesus with everything that I've got. The truth is that some of us today have been living a life that's about Jesus, but without Jesus. Putting him off, keeping him at a distance. We, we, we do just enough to believe, I'm, I'm still going to heaven. I'm all right. Which, by the way, you're not going to heaven because of anything you did to begin with. You're going to heaven because of the grace of the Lord Jesus by faith that you had in him and him alone, what he did. And so what you do and what you don't do isn't what it's about anyway. Come on. And so we got to get back to if I'm really in relationship with Jesus, I don't want him at a distance. I want to embrace him. I want to embrace all that he has for my life. I want to pull him as close to me as I possibly can. And can I tell you that when you do that, you got to start dropping some things. You got to start letting some things go if you're going to embrace him back. You ever given somebody a hug who doesn't hug you back? (laughs) A lot of us do that. Jesus won't do that. If you'll embrace him, he will embrace you. And the reality is he's already reaching out to you. No matter where you're at today, whether you're far from God, he's right behind you, reaching out to you, ready to embrace you. Whether you've been trying to walk with the Lord, but there's some compromise in your life, there's some excuses you've been making, he's in the same place. He's right behind you, ready to embrace you. The only question is, will you drop the baggage? Will you embrace him in return? Because that's the invitation that he's issuing to us. It's relational. There's a very real enemy who has his sights set on you, set on your children and on your children's children. It's just a spiritual reality. And when you begin to discern the season and the hour in which you're living, the natural response, hear me, is for an urgency to well up in your spirit, man. That you're going to respond with urgency to the hour that you're living in. Because these excuses and all of, all of the complacency and all of the compromise, that only happens when you're living clueless to the reality all around you. When you're clueless to the season and the hour that you're living in, 
You're, you've turned a blind eye to the spiritual realities, and it has allowed you to stay in this place. But when you open your eyes to what's really happening, there's an urgency that wells up in your spirit that says, all oh, that stuff's junk now to me because I realize he's coming quickly. And I need to respond to his invitation. I need to draw close to Jesus and stop putting him off. Now is not the time for us to decline the master's invitation. This is the moment to respond in faith and obedience to his voice. I'm going to ask the worship team to come if they would. This is the season where deliverance is just on the other side of breakthrough, where one righteous decision sets the stage for blessing. You don't need to worry about the next 200 steps you're going to take. You just need to look at the first step. One righteous decision, just simply accepting the invitation, just pulling up a chair at Jesus' table. That one decision sets the stage for blessing to flow, not just in your life, but down to your children and your children's children, that when you begin to live on purpose, when you begin to live on mission, when you begin to live intentionally steering towards heaven and not just drifting towards hell, I'm telling you that you're going to bring some people along with you, your children, your children's children. You're going to have a legacy that you're going to be able to leave to them because of one decision you made today on this Sunday morning in Rhinebeck, Iowa. There will come a day where you'll be able to look back on this moment and say, because I decided to leave all my excuses at that altar, because I decided that the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie was no longer good enough for my Jesus, but I'm gonna sell out and live for him and make his kingdom my priority. You're gonna be able to look back at this moment and say, that was the day that my destiny shifted, my family's destiny shifted. That was the day that I pushed back darkness and stopped pushing back Jesus. I'm done stiff-arming Jesus. I'm ready to embrace him, and I'm going to push back darkness by the power of the Spirit of God that lives inside of me. He's called me more than a conqueror. This is my moment for breakthrough, that bloodlines will be changed, that generational curses and trauma will be broken off. When you line up with kingdom principles, I'm telling you that grace is released to you. Grace is released to you, the kind of grace that empowers you to live for God, the kind of grace that empowers you to break chains and strongholds. And it doesn't have to just be biological children. Sometimes you've inherited, as we have, those with trauma. And you say, I'm breaking that off in the name of Jesus. That bloodline is broken today. That curse is broken. Those traumas are broken. I call them whole and healed in the mighty name of Jesus. There's something that needs to rise up on the inside of you, an urgency of faith that says, right now, I'm going to contend for breakthrough. I'm done pussyfooting around with the devil. I'm done playing games. It is not about religious games today, friends. It's about sitting at the table of Jesus. Respond to his invitation. Respond to his invitation. He's calling you today to step into real relationship, to follow him with all that you have. When you seek Jesus, you find him. The Bible promises that. What do you need Jesus to show up in in your life? In this moment, there's a need that you have. Sometimes, can I tell you, sometimes these excuses over here, They don't just blind us to the spiritual realities of the world and the day and the age that we live in. Sometimes these excuses and this this way of living blinds us to where we need Jesus to come in. Because, Because we convince ourselves that I'm content in this place. I've gotten used to the limp. I've gotten used to the trauma. I've gotten used to the dysfunction. I don't even see it anymore. I don't even notice it anymore. I just make excuses for it. But I believe that when we truly get a glimpse of Jesus, we realize all that we need from him. And that if if we really embrace him and the fullness of what he has for our life, he wants to do some things in those areas. He wants to do some things. He, He doesn't want you to have that limp. And I'm not just talking physically. There's some people spiritually limping around. And Jesus wants to cure you of that limp. When you say yes to the Father's call on your life, you discover that what he gives is greater than anything that you could ever secure outside of his will. Jesus tells us in the parable that the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, they were sought after by the master to come to the table again. The in were out and the out were in. He flipped the script. Maybe today you're living under a condemnation. You're living under a guilt 
that says, I don't deserve, I'm not worthy, I, I can't have a seat at his table. And Jesus is making it really clear, you too are invited. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you've been with. It doesn't matter. Jesus says, I don't care about that stuff. I'm calling you. There's still room, he says. There's still room at my table. Can I just say too, when we live as the people of God with kingdom priorities, we will say the same thing. There's still room at my table. It's never full. You can come. I got room. I'll make room. If I got to give you a little something of mine so I can't have as much, that's okay. I I'm going to bring you to the table. There's always room. So bring your broken self to him. Well, there's the downside of having a glass table up here. Bring your broken self to him. Jesus welcomes your brokenness. Come on, he, he died for your brokenness. If, it, if, he didn't, if he didn't love you in the midst of your brokenness, he would have never gone to the cross. He says, bring your broken self to him. Bring your secretly sinful self to him. Some of y'all have been hiding some stuff and, and convincing yourself over here that it's okay. I've got my excuses. It's okay. I can hang on to that. And Jesus says, bring your secretly sinful self to me. Bring your sexually confused self to him. Bring your traumatized self to him. Bring your double-minded self to him. His invitation is still good for you today if you'll let go of all your excuses. He doesn't care what you've done. He doesn't care who you've been with. He doesn't care about any of that stuff. He says, come, because I want my house to be what? Filled. I want my house to be filled. He's not rejecting you today. He's welcoming you. As I get ready to close, let's look at Revelation 3 and verse 19. Listen to these words of Jesus. He says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. This word today is because he loves you. The discipline that God brings through his word and by his spirit is because he loves you. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Not sin, indifference. This is a call to urgency. Turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to who? To the churches. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Is Jesus knocking on the door of, of the heart of sinners? Absolutely, but that is not the context of this passage. He's knocking on the door of church people's hearts. And he's asking you, will you go beyond your religion? Would you, would you sit down with me and we could have a meal together as friends? I believe that's what God is calling us to, a deeper devotion, a deeper intimacy with him. I'm gonna ask you just to stand up where you are. I really feel like the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on something very specific right now. And that there's somebody in this place who you would say, in your heart of hearts, you know that you were growing in intimacy with Jesus. You were beginning to hear his voice. You were beginning to feel his affection and he was shaping and molding you into a brand new person. And then you walked away and you stopped hearing his voice and you stopped feeling his tenderness and you stopped being transformed. And Jesus is saying, I'm still calling you. I'm still welcoming you. My invitation is still good. Will you come and sit at my table? I wanna have a meal with you as one friend to another. We're gonna worship. If this word is ministered to you in any way, if you need something from Jesus, if you're ready to lay down your excuses and to live with a sense of urgency for the kingdom, to respond to the call that God has on your life, this altar is open. We would love to come and pray with you. And after this song, I'll come back and I'll close this in a word of prayer. But would you come? Would you come? Come on, come on, keep coming. Just come right now. If you feel like God's pricking your heart, God's moving on your heart, respond to this word right now. Live with a sense of urgency. Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't wait for some other time. But right now, respond to what God is prompting your heart to do as we worship. Is the place 
So look forward to that that great feast that we'll share together i so look forward to that party that we'll be able to have together i so look forward to rejoicing with you on that day but here's what i believe in this moment there is a world that celebrates all the wrong things there is a world that is showing big celebration for all the wrong things reinforcing things that aren't building someone's life towards the kingdom in the end, they're just eroding their life. They're destroying their life while there's a watching world celebrating the destruction. I believe in this moment as the church of Jesus Christ that we should be celebrating that there's some people who said, I'm coming back into the kingdom, who said, I'm ready to respond to the invitation that the, the king, that the master has issued to me to come and sit at his banqueting table. So can we celebrate that today? Come on, can we celebrate that? No, I said celebrate. Come on. Can we celebrate it big? The world knows how to celebrate. Does the church know how to celebrate? Come on. God is good. His grace is sufficient. In closing, I want you to repeat this declaration after me because I believe there's power in the spoken word. I believe that when we begin to declare some things over our lives, there's, there's power where junk gets broken off and where we align our spirit with the will of God for our lives. And so say this after me. Say, if God's in it, count me in. If God's not in it, count me out. Come on, one more time. If God's in it, count me in. If God's not in it, count me out. You see, we need to live our lives as one big commitment to the things of God, to show up where Jesus is. And he doesn't just sit at the table all day long doing nothing, right? He's going to show up in your workplace. He's going to show up at home. He's going to show up wherever you are. If you'll look and have eyes to see, Jesus is showing up. And he wonders, will you respond to my invitation here, now? Will you live with a sense of urgency to show up where Jesus is? And, and, and have the desire that everything you do is to worship him, to build his kingdom, and for your life to line up with his word. 
Because if you can live that declaration that if God's in it, count me in, and if God's not in it, count me out, it's as simple as that, friends. If we can just do that, if we can live a life that's about Jesus, if, if our life can be about him too, about his kingdom, then we're going to be able to respond to the invitation at every turn in our lives, in every season, in every moment. We're not going to return to the places of our excuses. We're not going to return to the place of dark living. No, we're going to abide in the light. We're going to walk in truth. And God, we're going to show up where Jesus is. And God's going to bless that. God's going to bless that. So I want to pray blessing over you as you get ready to leave. I believe that God has done a great work in these altars, and it's just begun. It's just begun. So, Father, we thank you for your grace, your grace that is in this place, that is sufficient for us, that has invited us, that has welcomed, welcomed us back into relationship, welcomed us to have a seat at the table, welcomed us back into the call of God on our life that has been renewed God, I thank you for every person who has stepped into purpose, who has stepped into relationship and intimacy with you to respond to your holy hug, God, to say, I'm going to embrace you back, Jesus. God, we're done keeping you at a distance. We're ready to push back darkness. We're ready to see those generational curses broken off, those bloodlines broken today in Jesus' name. We're ready to see traumas healed in the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that there is a group of people here at New Life Church, this body of believers who say, I will not be the reason that somebody wants to deconstruct their faith, but I will be a consistent witness living for Jesus 24-7, 365. I'm going to live on mission. I'm going to love the people in front of me, and I'm going to go into the highways and the byways and compel people to come in and find their seat at your table because there is still room. Jesus, we know you're coming back, and we want to live in light of eternity. So on that day, Jesus, my prayer, and I pray it is the prayer of every person here, is that we will not show up empty-handed, but God, there will be souls that are one to the kingdom because we simply obeyed what you've put on our heart to do. It's not to our credit. But God, we just want to say yes to you. So if you're in it, God, I want to be about it. I want to be about it. Holy Spirit, guide and direct us this week. Use us as instruments of your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen.